we are, uh, we're going to jump into God's word, um, being reminded of God's goodness and faithfulness. Um, and, uh, and so I'll, to posture our hearts before the text, I, I would like us to uh, hear the text. Um, and so I'm going to ask that you uh, fix your eyes on the screen for the reading of God's word from which uh, the text will come this morning. You who seek the Lord, look to the rock from which you are hewn, and to the quarry from which you are dug. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who bore you, for he was but one when I called him, that I might bless him and multiply him. For the Lord comforts Zion, he comforts all her waste places and makes her wilderness like Eden, her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and the voice of song. Give attention to me, my people, and give ear to me, my nation, for a law will go out from me, and I will set my justice for a light to the peoples. My righteousness draws near, my salvation has gone out, and my arms will judge the peoples. The coastlands hope for me, and for my arm they wait. Lift up your eyes to the heavens, and look at the earth beneath, for the heavens vanish like smoke. The earth will wear out like a garment, and they who dwell in it will die in like manner. But my salvation will be forever, and my righteousness will never be dismayed. Listen to me, you who know righteousness, the people in whose heart is my law. Fear not the reproach of man, nor be dismayed at their revilings. For the moth will eat them up like a garment, and the worm will eat them like wool. But my righteousness will be forever and my salvation to all generations. Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake as in days of old, the generations of long ago. Was it not you who cut Rahab in pieces, who pierced the dragon? Was it not you who dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep, who made the depths of the sea away? for the redeemed to pass over, and the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. I, I am he who comforts you. Who are you that you are afraid of man who dies, of the son of man who is made like grass, and have forgotten the Lord, your maker, who stretched out the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth. And you fear continually all the day because of the wrath of the oppressor when he sets himself to destroy. And where is the wrath of the oppressor? He who is bowed down shall speedily be released. He shall not die and go down to the pit, neither shall his bread be lacking. I am the Lord your God, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. And I have put my words in your mouth and covered you in the shadow of my hand, establishing the heavens and laying the foundations of the earth, and saying to Zion, you are my people. Wake yourself, wake yourself. Stand up, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the hand of the Lord the cup of his wrath, who have drunk to the dregs the bowl, the cup of staggering. There is none to guide her among all the sons she has borne. There is none to take her by the hand among all the sons she has brought up. These two things have happened to you, who will console you, devastation and destruction, famine and sword? 
Who will comfort you? Your sons have fainted. They lie at the head of every street, like an antelope in a net. They are full of the wrath of the Lord, the rebuke of your God. Therefore hear this, you who are afflicted, who are drunk but not with wine. Thus says your Lord, the Lord, your God who pleads the cause of his people. Behold, I have taken from your hand the cup of staggering, the bowl of my wrath you shall drink no more. And I will put it into the hand of your tormentors, who have said to you, Bow down, that we may pass over. And you have made your back like the ground, and like the street for them to pass over. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that these words, though ancient and old, they are not dead. I pray, God, that your living word would take a hold of our hearts. That we would see you for who you are. That we would understand what it means to be a child of the kingdom. Father, help us to find great comfort in these words. Help us to run to you when we are in need. Our greatest need is of a savior. And Lord, we thank you that you sent Jesus to come and live the life that we should have lived and died the death that all of us deserved. We thank you for your amazing grace. And so God, I ask that you would stand in my body Think through my mind. Speak through my vocal cords those things you'd have us know, say, and do. May the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. God, you are our king. You are our redeemer. Would you have your way in this place? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One of the most well-known prayers in Jewish culture and custom is one called the Shema. The Shema. Shema Israel, Adonai Elohenu, Adonai Echad. That portion comes from Deuteronomy chapter 6. It is then followed, this prayer, this Shema, it's then followed by another piece which is then whispered. And then another piece that is then recited, very similar to the way that uh, the first century Jewish people would recite the scriptures. And it's a beautiful thing if you've never heard it. It's very poetic. But it starts with Shema. Shema Israel Adonai Elohenu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel. The Lord is God, the Lord is one. Hear, Shema, hear, it is to listen. Listen. And here's the interesting thing about Hebrew, is, is that they didn't have to add anything else after listen. They didn't have to add anything after hear, after Shema, because it was understood that if I hear, then I must do. Very different to us today. See, we say, listen, and then we still say, hey, listen, I still need you to go do it. And I know that when you read the scriptures, you realize, oh, actually, God also does that. Yeah, it's because that's how we are. But that is never meant to be the way. Listen, that when God speaks, we do. We obey. Hear, listen. And so the, the reading of our text, we, we find the, 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 the words, listen. Over and over and over again, it's, it's almost as if the prophet Isaiah is holding us by our clothing, or to say it this way, he's holding us and he's saying, listen, because what God has to say is incredibly important. It carries value, eternal value, and so this morning, I encourage you to listen. You see, in this chapter, the prophet Isaiah is giving encouragement to God's people. And encouragement is essential. We all need it, especially in seasons of difficulty. 
And this here, what we've just read, this was a difficult time. From the broader text, we can establish two particular burdens that were troubling the minds and hearts of God's people. Uh, Number one uh, could be uh, summarized this way in three words. Where is God? Where is God? See, the reason for this question was because of the after effects of war, the decline of faith among the people, the persecution of kings and leaders who ruled in Judah at that time, and then the exile, which in a short time was to carry many of them away into Babylon. This was a difficult time. And so, and so I can imagine them, them looking to the heavens and going, where are you, God? They were worried. They were troubled. They were distressed. And so right out the gates in chapter 51, Isaiah brings comfort and encouragement to them. In verses 1 and 2, he says, Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness, you who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were cut and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah who gave birth to you when I called him. He was only one. I blessed him and made him many. God is saying to his people, if I could bring the church into existence out of an aging man and a woman who was beyond childbearing, why would you doubt me? Why would you doubt my power? God is saying, I have a plan and I will bring it to completion. That which I begin, I will bring to completion. I I know that maybe what you're going through right now, you're going, it it doesn't feel like that. That's why feelings are a horrible savior. They're great to navigate stuff, but a horrible savior. Rather, we look to what God has said, because he will do. And so they're distressed, they're troubled, they're looking to the heavens, they're like, what what on earth is going on? Where is God? The second reason they're troubled is linked to the first one, is that everything seems broken down and in pieces. I mean, everything just looks like it's in shambles. But for this burden, it's almost like God goes, just continue reading. What does verse three say? For the Lord will comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places. Everything just looks like it's a waste place. I hear it all the time. Where is this country gone? Or or, where has the church gone? And he will make her wilderness like Eden and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her thanksgiving and a melodious song. These words of comfort and encouragement, they they weren't just for them, but they were meant for us today. No matter how isolated or desolated or gloomy things may seem, the Lord is able to comfort all the waste places of his church. He is able to make like Eden in Pretoria, in Centurion, in Mudderfontein, in Greater Gauteng, in South Africa, in Africa, the whole world. He is able to make them places filled with beautiful glimpses of his kingdom. And he does this through the local church. And we must never forget that. We mustn't just walk by sight. We're called to live and walk by faith. That though it may look like a waste place, we go, no, God, you're doing something here. You're doing something here. We're called to be awakened to the wonder of God. In every situation, in every circumstance, we are called to be awakened to the wonder of God and his transcultural church. Now, Among the encouragements that God gives through his prophet Isaiah in this chapter, I'd like us to take a look at verse 11 this morning. If you have a Bible, you can meet me there, but it'll be up on the screen as well. Uh, Verse 11 of chapter 51, and it reads like this, And the ransomed of the Lord will return, 
and come to Zion with singing, crowned with unending joy, joy and gladness will overtake them and sorrow and sighing will flee. Now there's a couple of things that I want us to take notice of here. And we're gonna walk through this verse. This morning is, it's gonna be a one verse punch. I have one verse and one verse for you. First thing to see. We're told that the ransomed of the Lord, other translations say the redeemed of the Lord. I, I like the, the word redeemed. It's New Testament language. There's nothing wrong with ransom, but I just, I love the word redeemed. See, these five words, the redeemed of the Lord, they, they carry so much encouragement and so much comfort. I find these words extremely comforting. Firstly, let me explain this word, redeemed or, or ransomed. In its simplest form, to, to be redeemed means to free from captivity by payment of a price. Another way to put it is to buy back something. That's what it means to be redeemed. And, and, and I believe that we don't use this word in everyday language. I think even the church sometimes, we, we don't fully press into this, but, but it carries so much weight because the gospel of Jesus Christ redeems us. Yeah. Amen. All those who receive the gift of salvation, you are freed from the captivity of sin and death, and you are brought into new life. That's why this word matters. The redeemed of the Lord. Yeah. Let me give you a few benefits of redemption. Eternal life, Revelation chapter 5. Forgiveness of sins, Ephesians 1. Righteousness, Romans 5. Freedom from the law's curse, Galatians 3. Adoption into God's family, Galatians 4. Deliverance from sin's bondage, Titus 2. Peace with God, Colossians 1. And the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So many benefits of our, for our redemption. Uh, here's another way to say it. To be redeemed is to be forgiven, holy, justified, free, adopted, and reconciled. All of that in one word. I, I want you to think about that for a moment. It's like that gift that keeps on giving. It's like signing up for something and thinking, well, I'm just going to get one thing. And then you open it up and you're like, oh my goodness. There is so much more, and yet so many of us don't live out of that. We just don't. God, I'll take that I'm forgiven, but I don't know if I'm holy. God, how could you really justify me? Like, could, really? What does it mean to be free? I say this often. So, like, so many of us in here are liberated. We've been liberated by the gospel but we don't live as free people because we still have ringing in our ears the voice of Pharaoh that you're not worthy, that you're not good enough, that you're a failure. That he, he's like, but, but remember what you did. But I'm a child, oh, but remember what you, I'm a child of God. Remember what you did. And, and it keeps you in this place of like, I can't, I can't move. That's a liberated person, but you're not free. That's part of our redemption, to be reconciled to the Father and then to be one another. I often wonder if the division that happens in the church is because we're not, we're not living out of our redemption because we've been reconciled to the Father and all of us get that. We have an amazing relationship with God, but I don't need to do this. I think you may not understand redemption. You might need to go back to the foundations we are the redeemed of the Lord. This also says that no matter how much indwelling sin we have, and friends, we have a lot, no matter how many times we fail and fall short, and we do that again and again and again, no matter how many times that happens, we are still the redeemed of the Lord. We are still the redeemed of the Lord. And that, my friends, is good news. Amen. And so some of you just need to breathe. Just breathe. 
you're, you're holding on to guilt and shame and bitterness and anger and, and doubt. And you're just like, I don't, but could God really save someone like me? But just breathe. There is more grace in Jesus than sin in you. God, God is not holding on to uh, the, the receipt of your redemption. Going one more time, one more time. If this thing doesn't turn on one more time, I'm taking it back to death and darkness. That's not, that's not how he thinks about you. I know we do that with the things that we have. Why do we keep the receipt? So that when this thing fails, I can take it back. God doesn't keep a receipt. You are purchased by the blood and that's it. You are his. It's Amen. done. Amen. Amen. You are sealed by the Holy Spirit. Sealed by the Holy Spirit. You belong to God. You belong to God. I, I know for even some of us, that's a, that's a difficult thing to say and to comprehend. Because this is so much easier to work, to work out our salvation. Yeah. God, I'll do, I'll do this today. I'll show up on a Sunday between 9.15 and whenever honor finishes, and, and then you must do X, Y, Z for me during the week. That's not how it works. You belong to God because you are the redeemed of the Lord. And that is such a beautiful thing. Such a beautiful thing. We should never get over that. We preach that. We teach that. We share that. We invite people into that. But I want us to notice the behavior of the redeemed of the Lord. And the ransomed of the Lord, or the redeemed of the Lord, will return and come to Zion. They will return, the text tells us, like the prodigal son. Every one of the redeemed, sooner or later, comes to the point in which they say, I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. This is the universal behavior of all the redeemed in this world. Whatever your background, whatever your background, we all speak the same language. We all return. Yes. Jeremiah 50 says this, in those coming days, says the Lord, the people of Israel will return home together with the people of Judah. They will come weeping and seeking the Lord their God. They will ask the way of Jerusalem and will start back home again. They will bind themselves to the Lord with an eternal covenant that will never be forgotten. We all will return. If you are redeemed, you will always return. And this is, this is a collective behavior for all of those who are covered by the blood of Christ. We will all return. Where, 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 are we, where are we returning to? Where we travel towards Zion. Now Zion, which appears over 150 times in the Bible, essentially means fortification. And, and has this idea of being raised up or, or a monument. Zion is also one of the names of Jerusalem. Isaiah 52 verse 1 says this, Awake, awake, clothe yourself in your strength, Zion. Clothe yourself with your beautiful garments, Jerusalem, the holy city. Zion is also a, a symbolic way of saying that they came, hear this, to church. They came to church. If you capture its full spiritual meaning, Zion is the very dwelling place of God. Yeah. Yeah. John chapter 1, believe verse 14, he be, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He dwelt among us. Revelation 21 verse 3, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. This, this Zion, this, it's, it's a place, but it's also a people. And it is where God dwells. He dwells among his people. 
all the Lord's people will find their way to church. And they will find their way to the gospel. And they will find their way to the truth. And they will find their way to the fountain of living water from which they drink. And friends, they become serious about the things that the world doesn't really care about. Serious about the word of God. Serious about their own souls and the souls of others. They are captivated by the grace of God. And they come to Zion. That all of us are on a journey. We're on a journey to this place. On a pilgrimage. I think that's how you say it. We're all on a journey. They come to Zion. They, They don't go to Athens, which was the center of intellect. They don't go to Babylon, which was the home of idols and self worship. They come to Zion. They come to the place where the truth of God is, where the truth of God is loved, where where it is embraced, where it is taught, where it is lived out. That's where they go. And so, friends, if you love God, then you will love the things that God loves. And one of the things that God really loves is his church. And so therefore, if you don't love the church, then you don't really love the things of God. Which begs the question, do you really love God? Let me me say that again. If you love God, then you will love the things of God. And one of the things God really, really loves is the church. Jesus says, I will build my church. God loves the church. And so, if that is true, then we must ask the question, if I don't love the church, does that mean that I don't really love the things of God? And if I don't really love the things of God, I should at least ask the question, as I examine my own heart, do I really love God? You cannot love the husband and be indifferent to the bride. Yeah. Yeah. At the very least, you can't, like all of us know, you can't do that. Here. Yeah. Man, I, I think oh, the husband is great, absolutely. I want to grab coffee with him. I, it's just incredible. The wife, nah. It's to invite the husband, but to be like, no, you can't bring your wife. Please don't bring your wife. How, how, like, how, how can we make sense of it? Like, how do we think that's okay? No, I have a fantastic relationship with Jesus, but the church, nah, indifferent. Don't really need it. And then we begin to bend scripture, yeah. where two or more are gathered. <laughs> like, if, if anybody ever says that again, like, like um, this one is for free. If anyone ever says that to you, it's like, no, nah, I love Jesus, but the church, no, nah, no, nah, we got something in our living room where two or more are gathered. You should go, so who are you disciplining? That's a discipline passage. You read it in context. To love Jesus is to love the bride. It's to love the church. And it's to say, I I want want to go, I want I want to go to this place where the church will be. Because look, I get it, I get it. Yes, the Holy Spirit lives in me, God is with me, Christ in me, 100 percent That is beautiful theology. But that's half of it. That's half of it. God says, But I'm with my people. I am with my people, the body, the church. This is why we value the church. This is why we gather. We don't gather because we have nothing else to do on a Sunday morning. We gather because we're saying, hey, all of us, we're heading towards Zion. And you know what? On it today, I'm limping a little bit. I know last week I was running, but hey, this Sunday I'm limping a little bit. I'm in pain. And so you know what? I just need the saints. I need my brothers and sisters to encourage me as we make our way to Zion. I need a word of encouragement. I need a word of comfort. Sometimes I need a word of rebuke. 
Because I found myself, you know when you're on a journey and then you find someone going, but what's that shiny thing over there? Hey, Jay. (laughs) It's shiny for a moment. We have to value and love the church. This is God's church. Jesus says, I will build my church. I know we have cool programs and really amazing vision statements and like we'll string lights and we'll do like some church smoke machines and it's it's amazing. I'm all for it. But don't miss it. Don't miss. We gather together because we are the redeemed of the Lord who are constantly coming back to Christ, coming back to the Father and saying, no, 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 because because we're all heading in one direction. That one day, one day, all, all of us who have crossed the line of faith, we we will stand as, as Revelation so beautifully gives it to us, we will all stand and we'll worship the one who is seated on the throne. Amen. We get to do glimpses of that here. We get to do glimpses of that here. Why would we not want to? They return. They come to Zion with singing, Isaiah writes. With singing. Newsflash, the people of God sing. Now I know many of us come, we come from different backgrounds and different practices and, but if anyone has told you that singing is not a good thing or is not a thing of the Lord, they are incorrect. The Bible is filled with song. It's filled with praise. It's filled with God's people singing. And here we are told that they come to Zion with singing. Why? Because we are happy people. The Lord's people are happy people. Now, I I know, I know that that sometimes that happiness, that joy, doesn't always make it to our face. I know. We need to work on that. Oh, but I'm full of, I'm full of joy. Praise God from whom all blessed. Like how? How are you full of joy? Like how? And then, and then you want to tell me, it's like, oh, that's just not my, uh, my custom. That's not my style. Don't ever invite me to your house where you're watching whatever it is that excites you because I will stop and look at you like this. <laughs> and I'll say, but I thought you said it's not your custom. Uh, are you telling me, are you telling me that, that a 24-year-old who's holding a rugby ball excites you more than the king of glory? Or or, or the concert that you go to, are you you telling me as the redeemed of the Lord, are you telling me that when I'm there, this is way more exciting than the king of majesty? Then we need to work on some stuff. We need to ask some serious questions. We need to examine our hearts because we are a happy people. Even in times of uncertainty and chaos and trouble, we have so much to be grateful for. Grateful for our salvation, that God reached out into the pit of our depravity and rescued us. So we sing. That He has placed me in community because we were never meant to live in isolation, beautifully designed for fellowship. So we sing. That he has given us the greatest mission. We are on the greatest adventure that we could ever be on. Now I know, I know some of you are, oh, no, I'm an entrepreneur, I've got the best idea, it's going to change the world. Maybe, maybe, until you die and hand it over to someone else who's going to run it into the ground. Oh, and no, I've got, like, you have no idea. NGO idea, it's literally going to change the world. I get it. And I'm all in. I'm all in. If you're telling me we're going to feed millions of children, I am all in. But friends, I want to feed millions of people spiritually. He has given us the greatest mission, which is the greatest adventure you and I will ever be on. So we sing. 
Friends, there, there is so much to be grateful for. There is so much to be grateful for. And, 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 and literally, I think sometimes we, we go, I'm, I'm, it's easy to see the kind of spiritual things, which at some point we need to do a series on this and just kind of debunk, like I've got spiritual and I've got like my normal things. No, friends, everything is spiritual. Yeah. All right, so it's easy to see those things, salvation, sanctification, justification, glorification, all the shuns. But there's like a whole bunch of other things that I'm like, I just, uh, it's just everyday stuff. No, it's not everyday stuff. It's the hand of God, his grace over your life. And so be, be grateful for that. I, I, I have a friend, I have a friend, a uh, pastor in the US, uh, and, uh, and he, he's started this thing where every year, he's got a list now, and, uh, and every year uh, on his birthday, he adds one thing that he's grateful for. He's almost 50, and so he's almost, he's got almost 50 things that he's grateful for. And, and I mean, right at the top, I mean, it's the gospel, the, everything that we would, amen, amen, the gospel, indwelling of the spirit, amen, the scriptures, amen, like all of that stuff, yes, 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 yes. And, and then he started to list some stuff, and I was like, oh, I'd never thought about that. I need to create my own list. And so on, on, on my list, I'm, I'm grateful for my amazing, incredible, unbelievable wife. I needed that one to sit in for a little bit. I just want to, <laughs> amazing. I'm grateful for my two kids who are healthy and growing. I'm, I'm grateful, I'm grateful that I am African. Gosh, I love being African. Yeah. Now I'm not against, not against other people. I love my brothers and sisters from Australia and Europe. I, lo- I love them, I love them. Yo, but I love being African. And that's something we can be grateful for. That's something we can thank the Lord for. That is something we can sing about. I'm grateful that God has given us the ability to take a grape, a bunch of them, and to allow them to go through a process which then they are stored in a barrel in a dark place for an extended period of time, allowing them to ferment, and then at the right time, I can open it and responsibly, make sure that's in the recording, responsibly enjoy it. I'm grateful for that. I'm, I'm, you know what, I'm, I'm grateful for all my brothers and sisters who are on a plant-based diet. No, for real, for real, they're amazing people. Because it means that there's more meat for us. <laughs> Amen, like, like, no, 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 hold on. And, and, and in that, in that, I am so thankful that I can take a piece of meat and put it on a fire and, and, and allow the fire to engage the meat. <laughs> And then at the right time, at the right time, take it off so that after it has rested, and I know some of you, this is new, this is new. You must allow the meat to rest. So you take it out, cut, no, let it rest. And then cut into it. There's a piece of meat out there called Wagyu. If you haven't experienced it, you must pray the Lord must open your eyes to the wonder of who he is. Friends, we're grateful for that. Here's a weird one. It's probably just for me. I'm grateful for Batman. I just am. I just, I, like, like he's, I'm, I'm grateful for Bruce Wayne. I'm, I'm grateful that someone came up with a story that this individual who's wrestling with a lot and there's a lot of self-righteous now, all of a sudden you're like, oh, I didn't realize that Batman was that deep. It is. Like self-righteousness and, and he wants to fix things on his own by works. And like I can look at that and be like, yeah, I think that's me. Minus the money, that's me. <laughs> like I'm, I'm just, I'm grateful for that. Like, like we have so much to be grateful for. And then so friends, we sing. I say this often, this is not Christian karaoke. 
We don't get a bunch of people up here and then it's like, oh, if I know the words, then maybe I'll sing. Or if I'm feeling it, then I'll sing, you know? But if I'm not, ah, it's not my vibe. It's not my, where the the hymns, where the this, where the... No, friends, we sing because we are reminding one another. We are ministering to one another. In fact, these words that we sing, they're, they're they're words of war to the kingdom of darkness who's always here going, you're not worthy, everything is broken, the wastelands, things are horrible, things, it's just, and you just go, no, 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 I'm grateful for the cup of coffee I had in Jesus' name. I'm grateful that God is saving people. I'm grateful that God is restoring marriages and reconciling people together. I, there is so, hey, we sing, and we sing loud. Yeah. They sing. We are a singing people, friends. Let me try to bring this home. I'm running out of time. We're told that they're crowned with unending joy. Joy and gladness will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will flee. These are what people have come to know as glory words. Glory words. I believe these words here are not just today implications, but eternal ones. Psalm 16, verse 11 says this, you will show me the way of life, granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you forever. Unending joy refers to the ultimate state, the final state of glory. That is the destiny which the Lord's people shall obtain, everlasting joy and happiness. And I love the detail of this description, crowned with unending joy. I mean, Isaiah could have just said joy. But he goes, no, 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 no. Unending joy, and you're crowned with it. You see, friends, to receive a crown is a sign of honor. Honor is being bestowed. And the one receiving must bow to receive the crown. You must bow. If you want to receive this this crown of unending joy, you must bow. You must humble yourself. So that when you stand, you might do so in glory. See the upside down kingdom here? If you want glory, you need to bow. That is how you are to receive glory. And this glory is not ours. It's Christ's glory. But he, he shares it with us. For all those who cross the line of faith, the redeemed of the Lord, we share in Christ's glory. This is true because scripture tells us, John 17, 22, Romans 8, 17, Ephesians 2, 6, 2 Thessalonians 2, 14, 2 Timothy 2, 12. It is the most beautiful thing in scripture that I get to share in Christ's glory. We're told joy and gladness will overtake them and sorrow and sighing will flee. Sorrow and sighing will flee. Like I mentioned earlier, I'm I'm aware that that there is plenty of sadness for a Christian life this side of heaven. We go through some tough stuff. I don't need to convince you of this. We, We all go through some stuff. We live in a broken world. But for the redeemed of the Lord, I want to remind you that weeping may endure for a night, To quote the King James Version, but joy cometh, cometh in the morning. The day will come when you will be sorry no more for anything and sorrowful no more for anything. All the things today which are the source of heaviness and grief for you, there will be no more. And we need to be reminded of that. Every conceivable comfort and blessing will be given to you. God would not withhold from you. He won't. He won't. I I, I get this picture of him just waiting at the gates of heaven. Waiting for his sons and daughters. Waiting to say, well done. 
to wrap his arms around you and then to say, the kingdom is yours. Share it with my son. Joy and gladness will overtake them. That they will be overtaken by joy and gladness. That they will be filled with joy and gladness. That they will be consumed with joy and gladness. And so my question to you is, what has overtaken you? What has filled you? What consumes you? And once you give that answer, if it's not the gospel, then my question to you would be, and how's that going for you? Be honest. You're like a person jumping from train to train to train to train, hoping to get to a destination, believing that that destination will give you this, but it won't. And the kingdom is just saying, get on the right train. Get on the right train. That's what the cross cries out to us. Get on the right train. Because we're jumping from this one, success, relationships, sex, and this, and this, and this, and this. And then we get frustrated, and you're like, ah, the next stop, I'm getting off, and I'm going to get on another one. And we just get, just get on the kingdom train. Where joy and gladness will overtake you. This is a promise for all of God's children. Sitler reminded us so beautifully yesterday that God is a a covenant-making, covenant-keeping father. God is a covenant-making, covenant-keeping father. And so what he says here is true. It's true for those who have crossed the line of faith, for those who hold on to Christ. It is true for us. And so you know what that should do for us? It should allow us to live well. In this world, it should allow us to live well. For people to look at the church and go, there's something radically different about this group of people. Everyone is talking about the economy and politics and and things aren't going well and everything's going down, whatever, and this and this and this and this. But yet the church show up and they sing because they're the redeemed of the people, of the redeemed people of God. It should radically change the way that we live because God is a covenant-making, covenant-keeping Father. But not only should we live well, we should die well. We should die well. That those who've crossed the line of faith, we, we, we were sad and we mourn for a moment because, because they're no longer physically with us, but we go, they are with the Father, enjoying every single promise that he has made. And one day I'll be there. So I'm going to live well, and I'm going to die well. That's the invitation. Friends, that's the gospel. And so my question to you as I call the band up to close us out is, is do you have that kind of surety in your life? Are you that secure in your life? Or are you anxious the whole time? Worrying the whole time. The invitation is to come to Christ. To lay your burdens on him. To cast your anxieties on him. To not live in fear, but to live in faith. Because our God is a covenant-making, covenant-keeping father. And he loves you more than you could ever imagine. You're going to go through some things. I'm telling you now. And if you haven't, you're like, I have have no idea what Oni's talking about. Just grow up a little bit. (laughs) Once you, once, yeah, just keep living. Once you get out of the house, once you start having to pay SARS, and I hope everyone here pays SARS, um, life gets real. But I can live well. Because my father loves me. And every promise that he has made is yes and amen in Christ. And so I take a hold of Christ. But here's the thing, I, I'm not holding on to Christ because of my power, I'm holding on to Christ because of his. He holds on to me because I've been sealed by the Holy Spirit. God, would you awaken us to the wonder of all of that? Because all of it is found in you. We need to speak to our hearts sometimes. It's like speaking to yourself in the mirror. You know, 
You know when you're going through some stuff and you're just like, I can't. You, you've managed to get yourself out of the bed and you're like, I can't live like this. And then you stand in front of the mirror and you're like, no, nah, no more, no more. Hey, honor, no more. We need to talk to our hearts that way. Wake up. Wake up. Awake, oh soul. And so, Father, I pray that that all of us would, would be so moved by your love and your grace and your mercy. That we would not normalize this, that we would we'd be so moved by your grace and your mercy that, that, we'd, that every day we'd find ourselves at the foot of the cross, that every day we'd find ourselves at the throne. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne, Lord. In Christ, we have been made righteous. And that is because your wrath has been satisfied. Poured out on Christ on our behalf. Justice fulfilled. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us to understand what it means to be children of the kingdom. And so, would you wake us up? Awake, O sleeper, and rise from the dead. And the Christ shall